Well, good morning again, everybody. Um, I am just so proud of the responses that we've gotten to all of the programming so far. Um, I think over the last couple of days, I've been talking, um, you know, pretty intensively throughout um, my virtual moderation of some of these sessions about intention. I think um, today is really um, from the very beginning a day where we really wanted to give you all a lot of food for thought. I mean, I think you've been, I guess it was a very intense day with a lot of information, a lot of, um, you know, because at the top of yesterday, a lot of very um, deeply culinary conversation. Um, today, though, we really wanted to make sure we set um, the tone of takeaway. We really wanted to give you all time and experts who work and care deeply about the ways in which we engage the African Atlantic. Um, the panelists for this opening session are some of the most dexterous, most intention-filled minds I know of. Um, Stephen Satterfield is a wonderful journalist, um, advocate. Um, his uh, platform, Whetstone, is giving us a global perspective on um, the makers and creators who are bringing food to us um, from all over the world, and usually in ways that we haven't considered before. Um, he's created this beautiful space that made him a perfect choice to um, to lead this kind con this conversation. Um, Sasi Ataka is someone who you'll hopefully see. Some of you will get the opportunity to um, experience her chocolate demonstration later on. Um, and her advocacy work, but also her um, lens through which she thinks about. Um, the ways in which people engage with her country, but also the continent through her tireless work with the UN. Just, uh, you're here. You, you just go to last year. Um, but also, uh, Simeon Hall and BJ Dennis, um, two of the most serious chefs I know. You got to experience them yesterday um, a couple of times, both with their food directly at the marketplace, but also um, in multiple sessions, um, are both so serious about where they are from, and serious about the ways in which people engage their work when they visit. And so these four, the way that they engage their work, um, I think give us a really beautiful um, starting point for today's, um, I don't know, today's session is really asking you all to think really hard about um, how you engage with our culture. So I don't know, I'm trying to land here, and I really think that this, um, I don't want to take too much space, because this is a, a relatively quick session, but um, these four are fire, and they are one of the, um, this is one of the sessions where we, um, we were curating and knew that it was going to be um, a really sort of kinetic moment. So I hope everybody is in place, but um, yeah, it's going to be a really good one, y'all, um, and a good kickoff to, to day three. Thank you. Okay. Well, I guess that means we're on. Um, I'm happy to be here with y'all. I'm happy to be here with the larger y'all. Seeing Dr. J in the front row, it's always a good day. Um, so I think the way that we should get into this um, is a framing that is topical, but also how I like to understand the world um, and our place in it, which is about origin. Um, so when we think about origin, or when I, let me speak for myself, think about origin, I think about it as a means of reclamation. It's a means of understanding, as it is both place-based and also culturally based and identity-based. So before we get into the diaspora, um, I'm curious how you all think about your origins and how you talk about your origins. Anyone? You want to go first? Ladies first. <laughs> okay. Um, for me, I, um, mine has sort of been a long journey. Uh, I was born in Ghana, and uh, my family moved to the U.S. when I was six. Food was something that we used to maintain culture um, in our home. So we... I think we ate at home and ate Ghanaian food. Um, I think every day except two days, my mother's birthday and Mother's Day. And so um, for me, it was a place of love. It was something that um, I 
was in search of. So I, um, I, I moved back to Ghana and have been on a journey um, trying to understand um, the food of my mother. I've also been lucky enough to have worked with the United Nations and traveled, I think, over 44 countries in the continent, spending time looking at the lesser known places and corners, meeting people, seeing foodways and understanding how it brings people together and can, it's really the, the, the fabric, whether it's on the economic side, um, whether it's on the health and nutrition side, whether it's on the, the arts, um, the culture side. So for me, it's just been a, something that um, is home. Food for me is home. And the origin um, really tells you about the taboos, it tells you about the, um, the patterns and how, how, how society has developed where you are. Well, good morning, everybody. So um, I'm from Charleston, South Carolina. So I know for me, you, when you raise up in a city like Charleston, where it's um, so blatantly in your face, but you don't know what you, what's in your face, because you just grew up in it. Um, you know, point of, point of origin for me is really deep. Um, you know, Charleston would say, they say it's the home of the enslaved Africans, and you know, the little nuanced things that we do, spiritual things that we do that you just grew up in, like don't sweep your foot with that broom. You know what I mean? Like the nuanced stuff that you just never really realize, you know, why some of the houses are paint blue. Um, why in church, when the ladies in particular will catch the Holy Spirit, they were doing a certain dance. These tra traditions that came from the motherland. You know, when you grow up in a city like Charleston where there's plantations pretty much up and down the coast and you're not taught in the school system about your history outside of you were a slave and then you hear about these planters who grew this rice, but they weren't planters. They were enslavers. The real planters were descendants of the Fula, the Gola, Mende, Palameke, so on and so on. And once you start, for me, once I start getting into food, because food tells me that story, when we eat red rice. Red rice is, I would say, the daughter of Chilof. So when you start to get into the food, and for me, I've always had parents who taught me history, made me read books like Malcolm X and Marcus, Gar Marcus Garvey. And when I started reading Charleston cookbooks, I taught a point of origin. You will see, these chapters, particularly Charleston Receipts, every chapter started off in Gullah. So it started to take me down a rabbit hole of really, truly looking deeper than, oh, Charleston's an enslaved, excuse me, enslaved person city. No, Charleston is a city with deep African roots. So for me, it's been a journey of understanding that and getting that out to the masses, and particularly in my community. I didn't start what I'm doing to be in magazines, to be on Hot and Hog. I never thought that stuff in my life. I was like, why isn't there representation in my city? And how come a lot of my peers just walk around clueless of the things that they do and don't understand why they do it? So food has taken me on a journey past actual cooking but an understanding of culture, and I call it culture through food for a reason, because it brings me to a place where my community can have a better understanding because there's so much disruption in, in the survival mode in the community that we don't really take the time to understand who we are and the roots of who we are. Good morning, everybody. Uh, I am from the Bahamas, uh, born and raised, and I still live and work from the Bahamas. Uh, but not the Bahamas that most people know, not just the one that has beautiful beaches, much more sunny than this it is here today. And, uh, but I, I'm from the Bahamas where my father's grandmother is the cousin of Sir Sidney Poitier, uh, where they lived a few blocks around from a house that's called Violets Are Blue. And if you know that term, it was the term that Dr. Martin Luther King sent via uh, mail when he was going to visit in code 
uh, right around the corner from uh, the area that Marcus Garvey mo wrote a lot of his speeches, where my father's mother is uh, was the one of the first black female rest restaurateurs of the region, and so much more. Uh, for me, it's all about making sure everybody knows that the Caribbean is in one homogenous amalgamation and that we are all uh, different. The only time the Caribbean is one melting pot is like I say, when it's the Olympics. When, if uh, Jamaica is in the runnings, then we all cheer on Jamaica. <laughs> Other than that, uh, we're pretty separate. Even in the Bahamas with 700 islands and keys, we cannot be lumped into one conversation because there's islands in the Bahamas where we have uh, the de descendants of the Seminoles, we have an Artec base, we have Geechee connections, we have over 14,000 hotel rooms, et cetera, et cetera. So my journey has been to get people to understand Yes, we have some of the most pristine beaches in the world. The sun is always shining. If it's not shining, it's liquid sunshine and everything else. But to know and to understand us on a level where we should be included in the conversation more. And so that is my, my quest and my hope. Um, even in these spaces, uh, I get looked at a little bit different because I'm from the place where people usually come to vacation. And so it's, it's, it's time for us, and hopefully I do it justice. Yes. Indeed. Um, so one of the through lines that we all share uh, is that we use food as our medium of understanding culture, articulating our work, making sense of our journeys. And we've all been in that work for some time. We've had time to refine our beliefs and our approaches. So um, I wanna see, you know, and again, anyone who wants to jump in, where, where are y'all right now in your place of practice with food as the medium to move some of these larger ideas around place and identity in our blackness, our Africanness. Um, what does that look like in, in practice right now for y'all? Well, for me, I, I've been saying to everybody that your plate is your flag. Mm -hmm. And so if you think about it, what we eat is such a representation of who we are. In most instances, when we eat our food, when we put what we are and who we are on our plate, it is a summary of the journey that we've been on, that we're going on, and everything else. The best food in the world uh, either creates a memory or it reminds you of something. And so that can be good or it can be a challenge. But for us, it's a, about understanding that. It's about, you know, uh, when you, for example, when I lived in Hawaii, uh, I couldn't get a local to make an Hawaiian pizza because it's an insult, you know what I mean? But everybody uses it as though that's uh, authentic. And so for me, it's just about making sure that everybody understands the impact of, of food and culture. Uh, three of the main components of culture to me are music, food and art. But, for example, you can come to the Bahamas and never hear Rake and Scrape or Junkano. You can come to the Bahamas and not really dive into the art scene, but you gotta eat. And so once you uh, uh, experience those things, we have to make sure that we're being responsible in what we're telling people when they come to visit us. So if you came to visit me, you can get it. You ain't gonna get the play version, you can get the real version. Mm -hmm. And even when I come to do events like this, it's about being authentic. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, 
you, you live in an area where people tell you it's too spicy. Well, maybe you need to. <laughs> <laughs> that's a you problem. You know what I mean? so, and so that's, that's, that's how I look at it. And yeah. Food and culture is such a big, big deal. Okay. Um, I guess for me right now, where I'm at with um, food, I think it's going past cooking and more of reconnecting, reclaiming, and understanding. Um, it's a few examples for me. So growing up, you know, people think of Charleston, think of shrimp and grits, but the, the true dish of Charleston that you see in homes, no matter the racial background, is okra soup. You go online, you hashtag okra soup, it takes you to Nigeria. It takes you to different places in West Africa. You know, I was in Benin a couple years ago and eating gumbo, the real gumbo. But you here in the States, people to this day will say, oh, gumbo, that's a Cajun dish. It's not. The word is African. You know, so it's, for me now, it's kind of taking food and making it a thing where we are understanding point of origin. Prime example, I'm in the Bahamas. I lived in the Virgin Islands for four years, um, from 2004 to 2008 in St. Thomas. Um, loved the food there. Didn't see anybody eating grits. I didn't think anybody ate grits, grits in the West Indies until I went to Haiti. And then I went to the Bahamas. And I didn't know about our connection. Truthfully, I didn't know about the connection to Charleston and the Bahamas until probably the last couple years. And I went to, I'm in the Bahamas, and here we are, the storyteller, She's talking about okra rice. You know, we call it Limpin' Susan, you know, which is the quote unquote wife of Hoppin' John. But if you dig deeper, those two colloquial names are very problematic also, because they represent a, a stereotype of a African American hopping around who's dirty and can't dress well. So we think of Hoppin' John, like, oh, that's a wonderful dish, but the name is truly problematic when you dig deep. And that's what I'm saying when I study more of the food ways is a deeper understanding of certain narratives. Mm -hmm. So I'm in the Bahamas. She's singing about what, grits. I'm like, grits? And that's when we started talking. So for me right now, food ways has taken me to more of an academia um, and a reconnection and reclaiming. Like Selassie, I, we met Royal Flavors a few years ago. Mm -hmm. And we just started talking. And she said, yeah, she taught about these ingredients, sorghum, millet. And I said, yeah, I used to be grown in the low country of South Carolina. In fact, I'm doing a 90th birthday party for Miss Emily Meggett. I'm going to give her a little shout out. If you haven't got her cookbook yet, uh, Gullah Geechee Home Cooking, you should get it. She's turning 90 in a couple of weeks. And she taught to me as a youth about her grandparents, who I think were first generation out of enslavement, doing millet beer. So there's these whole parallel similarities that when, for me, the food ways is taking me past cooking and more into the academia, understanding and reconnecting, reclaiming. Love that. Uh, from my side, um, when I moved back to Ghana, I was doing a panel discussion and the panel was about how does the arts, um, what role did the, does the arts have in build, nation building? And um, there were, the photographer, uh, an artist, uh, a writer, and then there was me. And I think everybody was kind of looking and they were like, what is this cook doing up on the stage? Like, I don't really understand. And someone in the back was like, what's the difference between a chef and a cook? And before I could respond, um, someone else like heckled and said, a chef is someone who cooks for people who are not hungry. Mm. And in the Ghanaian context, it's actually how they see it, but also for me was actually interesting because I think that he really encapsulated what I was doing. A lot of what I want to do and what I've been um, working towards is how do I secure, how do I make sure we're able to eat with our ingredients in 2050 or beyond? That's the question that I ask myself every day. So right now, when I, my, in terms of my practice, I've taken it beyond the table um, with one aspect, um, which was um, during COVID, we, I pivoted. Um, I was doing chocolate truffles at the end of my meals. And people started asking for them. So we were, you know, we were making the chocolates in Ghana. 
um, for everyone trying to add value to cocoa rather than the extraction of cocoa, which has been done for so many years, generations. And so what I did was the chocolates are you know, things people know and love, adding value to something local, but then the spices, I decided from a chef's perspective, how do I integrate spices and flavors that people don't know so that we could have a conversation in a box of chocolates? And so that's what we started doing, and we started exporting it. We're selling in the US, we're selling it in other countries. Um, so that's one way for us to share culture, but also hopefully stimulate. And I always say it's, for me, when I, when I think about food, it's culture, community, and cuisine intersecting with environment, sustainability, and economy. Mm -hmm. So by doing this, I'm, for example, one of the ingredients is prekase, which is on the arc of taste of slow food. Another one is dawa dawa, which is being done by women in northern Ghana, um, and it's kind of going out of style, right, because of the Maggie's and other products that have come into the market that are much cheaper. So how do I bring these into the chocolate? How do I have a conversation, get people talking about it? Um, I'm also working with, um, I started an institute to try to figure out how to document and preserve our culinary heritage, and through that, um, collaborating with artists um, one of them is an artist and um, he does satirical cartoons. We started talking about, you know, the whole long story around Jalof, which I won't get into, but... Um, Wisely. <laughs> but the, the, he, did, he did a beautiful image and it's a cartoon um, with the three presidents, um, Ghana, Senegal, and Nigeria, fighting over a plate of Jalof rice. And in the back end, there's actually a Chinese prime minister walking away with the continent, the African continent. Mm. And so, you know, we're having this jollof war, but we've totally missed the point of what's actually happening to our foodways. The, like when you're looking at a plate of jollof rice in Ghana, it's actually the rice is from Asia, the chicken is from Brazil or from China. Um, we've got salad cream from the UK. Depending on the time of the year, the cabbage or the um, tomatoes are coming from the Netherlands or Mali or Burkina Faso. So less than 5% of that dish is contributing to the economy of a Ghanaian producer. Mm. So we have a national dish which is not supporting the nation. So those are the conversations that we're able to have beyond the table. Um, we were able to bring in 120 varieties of African indigenous rice because in Ghana, most of the rice that we actually grow is Asian varieties of rice. Mm -hmm. So we created a, an art installation with it and so um, trying to see how to now grow that out um, with growers and seed breeders so that we can actually give it to, we found a, um, a collaborative, a cooperative of 2,000 female rice growers. And once we get the right rice, we're hoping to get them to grow it out. So that's really looking at the future um, and understanding how do we actually preserve and actually get our food waste to start thriving uh, within all that's happening. That is incredible. Um, you know, on the using media as a means of, of preservation um, is obviously center to my work, but in talking about origins, the work is really about the preservation that begins on the land. So I'm, I'm appreciating the fact that in the current practices, um, we're not able to divorce the craft in the kitchen or the dialogue in the kitchen without now connecting that back to the preservation that has to happen on the land if not for the physical geographical space itself, but the preservation of the seeds, right? Um, I wanna actually say more about this, like in terms of sustainability and in terms of the land itself, what kinds of conversations are y'all having in partnership um, with uh, folks on the land who are moving in tandem with this preservation work? That's deep, because I mean, that's, that's such a layered question, right? You know, because like you said, even in Charleston, most of the African-American restaurants don't even use local products. Exactly. And then when you talk about rice, you know, we got up Ichi culture, it was the rice culture. Um, you, I'm very, I think I'm, I'm, I'm privileged I'll, I'll admit it, I'm privileged to be able to have access to Carolina Gold Rice, but at the same time, where are the rice growers? Because we were the rice growers. You know, 14 million pounds of rice documented in 1860 in a 20 mile radius in the low country. 
That's not the whole low country. I'm talking about a 20 mile radius of town, Georgetown County, South Carolina. 14 million pounds of rice done by enslaved people, enslaved Africans. Not a cent of that money during enslavement, obviously, and after enslavement, did any of these people see. But they were the engineers behind growing this rice. So now we are trying to figure out how to reclaim it because capitalism plays a big role in stopping us from being able to even access a lot of things. So for me, I work directly with a lot of farmers. Um, I'm actually in conversation with the USDA to hopefully get a commercial kitchen. I mean, that's a whole other story. That's my little thing I'm working on right now in the rural, right outside Charleston in the rural area. It's something that will kind of be able to focus on supporting directly African-American farmers, but all farmers in general, because farming, in a sense, is becoming a problematic thing because we are so used to the grocery store chains and not supporting our local food system. And also trying to figure out how do we get agriculture back in the school, school system so the kids who ancestors look like me and others get back to their agrarian practices and understand that there's a profitability in it. So um, reclaiming the land is, uh, and then you know in Charleston, low country, you know, as you have, you've ever been, um, one of the main things we're losing is our property, our land. And how do we get people to understand there's a way to circumvent capitalism. I mean, you can't avoid it. You live in America. It's just what it is. But how do you use it to benefit yourself and your future generations in a way that, and I don't think you ever say capitalism truly be positive, but in a way to make sure that you sustain. Um, and so I'm working with farmers. I'm part of Jubilee Justice. Y'all can look it online. It's a, group of was a lady out named Conda Mason out of Oakland, California, who was working with farmers in Mississippi. We started with some in South Carolina to regrow rice, African-American farmers to regrow rice. Rice growing is not easy. It's not easy. I mean, and you need, you need material, you need you know, capital, you need things to make it happen. But that's a very layered question, man, because, you know, I think my work, if you truly look at my work, it's been about sustainability. It's been about preserving seeds. But at the end of the day, you got to have the, the people with the like mind to want to get back to that. And when something like enslavement happened, you look at agriculture in a way now where it's not positive. You know, both my parents grew up farming, not because it was something they wanted to do. That was the way you lived. My parents were land rich, money poor. It was sometimes in the year that my mother couldn't go to school because she had to be in the field. And my aunt told me a story one time, like, say, your mama wanted that education so bad that she would hop on that school bus knowing that she wasn't supposed to go to school that day, knowing when she came home, she was gonna get in trouble. So it's, uh, I guess it's a mental change we have to have throughout our culture about why agriculture is important. And everybody can't farm. But if you can't feed your community, how are you really living? So it's, um, for me, it's very important. But um, that's, that's a, I can go on and on and on. So that's a deep, deep winded question, but I, I appreciate it. Yeah. Um, for me, it's, uh, anytime you live somewhere where tourism is your mainstay, it comes with advantages and many disadvantages. Uh, people, and in these conversations, the expectation is that everybody should be focused on sustainability and making sure that there's conservation and movement. But the truth of the matter is, it, it's, it, it doesn't happen. There are bohemian chefs who fight me tooth and nail when I speak about supporting local. There are sometimes more uh, support from outsiders than there are from my colleagues, so. Sorry, when you say they fight you, what do you mean by that? Like, what's I mean, the resistance? There's, there's, there's uh, harsh uh, responses and uh, a lack of support because, you know, some of my friends are hotel chefs, for example, and it's much easier for them to order from Cisco than it is to go down to the dock and hand pick the fish. And so, the, 
they're not doing it. But the good thing is that it, the, the needle is moving. Uh, just recently, I was appointed the chair of the Agro-Tourism Board. And so this is the first time a chef has ever been uh, given that responsibility. And so, you know, every time I go to a meeting, I always think it's my last meeting because I'm so adamant about changing the narrative. Because imagine living in the islands where uh, seafood is so abundant and there are so many sustainable products, but the number one uh, fish is salmon. You know what I mean? And so that is something that for me, uh, you know, because I work for myself and, and I maintain uh, in my own lane, I can, you know, be a little bit rebellious, but for a lot of people, that's not an option. And so we're working to make sure that that happens. And we definitely need to understand, and I think even as uh, tourism moves away from the average tourist to more traveler, uh, there needs to be some responsibility on visitors as well to make sure that you are um, being a responsible traveler. I know that's not something people want to hear when they go on vacation, et cetera, but you can't take up the mantle and drop it just because you're not where you are. So you definitely need to be be able to support that. One thing that we have in the Bahamas is uh, a season for our spiny lobster. And, you know, persons like myself, when I have visitors, etc., I will leave a job if a visitor asks me for spiny lobster out of season. And it happens all the time. Uh, you, you see people going and killing lions, and you see them uh, overfishing and doing all sorts of irresponsible things. And so it is definitely the job of everybody to, to make sure that the world is more sustainable because like Selassie said, 2050, what are we going to leave? We are tomorrow's ancestors. And so what we do today will affect what happens tomorrow. Indeed. Um, I'm, I kind of want to talk more about the well, what we're essentially talking about is the responsibility of us, of the larger collective of consumers in relationship or a marketplace, maybe in relationship to the work that honestly all of us do, right? Um, if we don't have black publishers who care about preservation work, then what is what are the mediums? You know, if we don't have seeds, like I think we understand the implications of that. And so the, on the marketplace side, um, I want to give you all an opportunity to maybe make a direct appeal request for what support looks like in your particular work or your field. Because, you know, uh, as Brother BJ said, we cannot escape the inevitabilities of capitalism in our work. But sustainability is not just environmental work. It's making sure that folks like y'all who are on the vanguard of the preservation work get to endure, right? So that the future generations have something to look at, to build upon. Um, so what does support look like from a marketplace side for the work that you're doing? How can we be supportive? I think for me, the first one is, um education, um, how are consumers, how are companies educating themselves on, on the cuisines, on the cultures, on um, what's happening um, beyond what they currently consume. Um, I think there are a lot of people out there, I mean, and when I say consumers, it's, it's, it's even, I don't know, uh, the wider gastronomic community, the continent has been ignored for so long and it's like you don't see any of these chefs or restaurants listed. At the end of the day, it's not my job to come and find you. You travel everywhere else, but you haven't come to visit. You haven't tried the food. You don't understand the palate. Um, you, you know, if you don't educate yourself on the ingredients, on the culture, on all these things, you will not understand it. So that's, that's 
the, that's the first. The second for me is how do we extend the table beyond um, sort of visibility? I think there's a lot of like, come and do a talk and then um, I'm done, I've checked the box. And the, my question is, what are you doing to make sure that the cuisines and the foodways that are associated with that are actually supported and are able to thrive? Not survive, not get, not get representation, but to thrive. What are we doing? What partnerships are you creating? What support are you giving to allow these um, cuisines and the associated ingredients, for example, you know, if we're talking about jollof rice, how are the cultures that have actually sustained and, and uh, kept this cultural um, wonder alive? Um, how, you know, how is that going back? Um, and then the third one is, give us your money. Let's talk money. Are you supporting these companies? Are you, do we know where ingredients are being sourced from? Um, and, it's, and for me, I think, going back to the, the second point is, it's not necessarily like, wow, I've learned about this one ingredient and now I'm gonna package it. No, I've learned about this ingredient. How do I support someone who's already working in it? And I think that's where things need to, uh, to change. It's, we should not continue the conversation of extraction. Yeah. How are we supporting those who are doing the work? How are we putting money with those who are doing the work? How are we putting money back into the communities? For the work that I do with the chocolate, the idea is that the money goes back to where these ingredients are coming from and, and, and who is actually the culinary custodians um, that allowed me to be able to have this ingredient in the chocolate. I love that, Slashi. That is so important because, yes, for real. It's such a... Um, uh, a reflexive, prescriptive thing, especially for folks from the U.S., is just turn everything into a business. Everything doesn't need to be a business. That is a disease of capitalism. Sometimes the right response is to find out who is doing the work and to support those people directly. Incredibly important. Thank you for that. Um, I mean, for me, because I'm, I'm fighting the machine. You know, I'm from Charleston, so. Um, it's, it's just a different beast when I'm dealing with my CVB who buys every year travel and leisure to pay them to be top city in the country for tourism. That's bought. That's, no, that's not hidden. That's bought with taxpayer money. So for me, I'm a voice in a community that the majority don't want to hear. So, but I'm never scared because I've been in it. Born and raised, so I know what I'm dealing with. But like I said, everything you see in Charleston has been systematically in place for years. Even before I was born, this was part of a plan. To, a plan to say, you know what? We don't want people to know this culture that made this city go. We want to kind of slowly push it to the side. We want to gentrify this city to the point where you don't even know that black folks existed mm. downtown Charleston. But you walk around, you see it. You may not know it. So for me, I do that work in my community. And what I need the media to do is when you come to Charleston and you go to our CVB, you, you say, no, I want to know about Gullah culture. Because the work I'll do, I'll be in my community. I sit with farmers. I sit with activists. I don't consider myself an activist. I consider myself a person of the culture. And if that's activism, cool. But real activists out here putting their neck on the line every day. So I sit with activists and say, all right, what you need? Because I know I have access to certain avenues. But I also know that I'm fighting a beast that's billions of dollars just in the low country region. Things that are bought. Charleston, top 10, city in the country again. 10 years in a row. Come on. Come on. That's bought. That's paid out of taxpayer money for them to stay in these positions. My, my, the CVB doesn't even deal with me anymore because they know what I'm about. But guess what? I built a platform. And I also want to thank media because media has helped me build a platform outside of Charleston for people to say, OK, no, we want to know about this brother and what he's doing. And the more y'all help me, the more I'm able to help on the ground in my community. So um, yeah, it, it's something that I'm passionate about. but. Just continue to support and continue to search, just search for us. Search. Uh, and for me, it's, it's two things. Uh, one is uh, 
for us to continue to show up and show out mm -hmm. as a people to make sure that we cannot be overlooked because where uh, excellence is excellence, you know what I mean? To make sure that we are packaged and available to come to the table at a level that we have not done before. And then more specifically for the Bahamas, anybody in here that plans to visit or come to the Bahamas or invest in the Bahamas, look at the Bahamas in its truest form, not the form that you see on the pretty ads, not the form that you know reminds you of sleep music and waves and crashing sounds, but the one that is about the truth, you know what I mean? The exploration of the deep rootedness and our uh, contribution to the conversation to make sure that you eat my Bahamas, that you support my Bahamas, and you understand what that means. So that, you know, uh, when you go in a store, know that yeah, you see a fragrance called Bahama Breeze, that ain't have nothing to do with it. <laughs> we don't know what that is. So, you, you know, ha have that understanding and be discerning enough to know that uh, there's more to most of us and everybody in this room that you've heard in the past. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, well, I want to thank all of you for the work that you're doing. It makes my work more relevant and possible as it gives me something to look at and uplift. Um, and I know that Therese isn't here right now, but um, I also want to lift her up because there are so many incredible people who are in Napa for this week that um, I know are here because of our deep respect, appreciation, and admiration for her. I'm at least going to count one among us, um, and I know there are many others, so I want to just shout her out. Um, and yeah, what that looks like for us, you know, we, I publish a magazine. Um, we are constantly looking for ways to use media as a way to uh, promote and showcase people who are doing cultural preservation work with food as the medium. So if that means something to you, we have a whole universe of podcasts and magazines and websites that you can check out. So thank you very much. So uh, thank you to our panel once again. And I will say on that note, um, in the app, you will find links um, and information to uh, learn more about their work, their businesses, all of that. You'll be able to find that in the app. Um, and uh, I think as we go forward with this last day of Worlds of Flavor Africa, I, I too, on behalf of the program team, the operations team, I also want to say that uh, Therese Nelson has been a joy to work with, is really the intellectual center of this program as well as the heart and soul of it. And so um, we are just grateful that uh, she's been part of this. And uh, sad that she can't be with us here in person, but she's always in our hearts, but she is always uh, watching us on uh, virtually. Um, and so uh, now we are going to go to our slides. So I do. Uh, want to say, so we're going to block number three of our breakout sessions. Um, and then let me pull this up because trying to read it um, while I'm looking at the screen is not going to work. All right. So uh, who is in Cuisines of Migration, Tastes of Home? Uh, so you are going to just stay here. You're in Ecolab. We have. Um, those of you who are going to be in On Returning Home uh, with Michael Legbede and Nana Wilmot, you will be, you'll go upstairs uh, to Chuck Williams. Uh, you'll walk past Heston Kitchen. That'll be on your right. 
And then we've got, um, you're going to join myself and um, Hua Hassan and Diana Tandia in the Woodstone Outdoor Live Fire Kitchen. You're going to go out there all the way to the end, and you'll see us outside on the left. We've got uh, building flavors, the culinary richness of soul food and Haitian cuisine. Um, that is in the restaurant at Copia, which is on the first floor. Um, that, uh, you, if you haven't been there before, you'll, you'll walk through. It'll be on your right. And then we've got um, Keeping African Culinary Traditions Alive is Napa Valley Vintners Theater. That is going straight on this first floor all the way to the end. It'll be um, on your right. Uh, Selassie will be leading the Hidden Histories of Chocolate, uh, which lucky for you, if you're in that session, um, that is in private dining rooms one and two. You're going to walk out on the first floor. You'll go past the bookstore on your right, and that will be that beautiful room with two long rows of tables. And then I think that's it for those. Um, and then after the breakouts, you'll enjoy the flavor discovery break in the atrium from 10.30 to 11 a.m. This is sponsored by Bush's Beans, Culinary Sciences, and the Perfect Puree of Napa Valley. And then we come back here to our last session at 11 a.m., Next Steps, Black Foodways, and Lessons for the Future. So thank you.